about milled flour, everybody. It's a revolutionary product, going to completely change your business. I'm excited to be here. I'm kidding. We're not going to talk about that. I'm excited to be here. I got to hang out with you all last night at the Jamboree. It was really nice. Your kids were hogging the top floor of that treehouse. I'm not happy about that. I didn't get up there, but it's okay. Wonderful place to be. Super happy to be here. And I'm excited for you because we are going to have a very good time. We are going to talk for the next little bit about how to be more innovative, how to come up with solutions to problems, optimize systems, and occasionally create entirely new products, programs, and processes. It is thanks to innovation that we have some of the world's most amazing things, things like light bulbs and fiber optics and beer helmets. <laughs> Those are awesome. They free your hands up so you can hold more beer. I don't know why you're not wearing them right now. And today, we are going to talk about how you can come up with the most amazing innovation since sliced bread, which is a phrase, right? You guys are in baking. You'll appreciate that phrase. It's a dumb phrase. I will concede that bread is amazing, but it did not take a genius to figure out that you need to cut it in order to shove it into your face. How is this supposed to work? I've baked the product, but I don't know how to get it in there. This wasn't a problem anyone ever had to solve. Now, there are two reasons that I think you should care about being innovative. The first is so that people do not eventually make fun of your backwards and crappy company. Because as we all know, those entities, those individuals that fail to evolve, adapt, and innovate are the ones that we all eventually make fun of, like Blockbuster. Did you know they actually had the opportunity to buy Netflix back when Netflix was still a small company? Yes. But they chose not to. Apparently believing that this whole watching movies at home in your pajamas or naked without having to go in public and argue for 45 minutes about what to rent was a fad. And that is the reason that the only decent use of your Blockbuster card today is breaking into poorly secured homes. So this is the first reason I want you to pay attention because I don't want this to happen to you. But the second and, in my opinion, more important reason you should care about innovation is because it is the best way to keep you from getting bored. Because if you never do anything new, you're just doing the same stuff every single day, right? You're going to work, you're doing some stuff, you're avoiding your weirder colleagues with their oversized lollipops. Then you're going to go to lunch, and you're going to go do some more stuff, drive home, watch TV, and then cry yourself to sleep. <laughs> and none of us want this for ourselves. None of us said when we were kids, when I grow up, I want to be a mindless drone wallowing in a swamp of monotony until one magic day I ooze into retirement. Being innovative is not just a business strategy, it's not just good for your professional growth. It's at the heart of what makes life worth living. It's what makes us feel like we are moving forward in some meaningful, active, useful way. Whether we're talking about building business success or our own personal happiness as well. This is the easiest and most effective way for us to feel engaged and enthusiastic in our own lives. And it is not difficult. And if you take nothing else away from what I say today, which is very possible because some of you are hungover. So if you take nothing else away today, please remember this. Being innovative, being creative, coming up with solutions to problems, taking advantage of opportunities is not hard. We just have a tendency to make it sound like it's hard sometimes. Uh, can show of hands, and I'm not really going to call on you for pretty much anything, okay? But show of hands, how many of you have had to suffer through this crap before? How many of you have had to listen to anybody talk at you about how to be innovative? I'm sure you have. Like, it's a very common subject, right? TED Talks, lots of books about it. And if you have, I am very confident that the subject of innovation was introduced to you something like this. Everything you're doing right now is about to become obsolete. The world's a changing faster than ever before. And if you do not come up with some massive game-changing industry shakeup in the next 18 seconds, you and your company are going to spiral into oblivion. Thanks very much for listening. I've also got a book you could read to scare the crap out of you, too. I've heard a ton of people talk about innovation like this, and that's not useful. That's scary. But we only have two reactions to fear. There's only two things we know how to do with fear, and that's fight or flight. So if I stand up here and try to scare you into being innovative, do it or else, you're going to do one of two things. You're going to fight back. You're going to say no. Or you're going to just hide or duck and cover, wait for the whole thing to blow over. And neither of those are good approaches to anything. Those are reactions to things. And I think it's safe to say most of us would prefer to be more proactive in both our professional and our personal lives. So by the end of our time here together, you're going to understand that innovation is easy, that you already know everything you need to know in order to do it, and you can do it anytime you want. This is not the province of some privileged minority of geniuses. This is built into our DNA. There are only three steps to follow, and all three of them are ridiculously easy. And we're going to get to that in just a second. But first, let's get rid of the fear. When people talk about the need to innovate, they have a tendency to talk about your need to come up with your next big thing. 
Market forces are constantly changing. Your competition's nipping at your heels. There's a pandemic, and we need to come up with something massive and disruptive and immediately awesome. And that is just a really inaccurate way to think about how innovation happens. There's this tendency to believe that you should tomorrow come up with like the next Google or Facebook or whatever. So let's put the pace of innovation into proper perspective, okay? This right here, what you're looking at on the screen right there, that is currently the next Google. Because right now, whatever that is, is a couple people working in a garage that nobody's ever heard of. This one right here is the next Facebook. Right now, the next Facebook, whatever that is, is a college kid in a badly decorated dorm room. Those companies didn't start amazing and giant and innovative. They became that way over time. They didn't even think they were going to become big and giant and especially innovative. Google tried to sell itself to AltaVista, another early search engine provider, for the not-so-amazing price of $750,000 because they never thought they were going to turn into Google. Mark Zuckerberg tried to sell Facebook to MySpace and a few other companies because he never thought Facebook could turn into Facebook. And Amazon was never supposed to sell everybody everything from lawn chairs to spent uranium rods, you know. It was only ever supposed to be an online bookstore. That's how innovation happens. It doesn't come in these big, giant ways. Like, your best practices, the things that you're doing at work right now that are the best things you do, that you can't imagine doing business without them, they don't exist because somebody shot out of their desk one day and said, Eureka, I figured it out. It's not what happened. They exist because somebody kicked back and said, huh, that's kind of interesting. wonder what we can do with that. That's where innovation comes from. Those of you who are married, I know a lot of you here with your families, your kids and everything, I'm very confident that your marriage did not begin with you sitting down on your first date and saying to your soon-to-be spouse, I can already tell I'm going to marry you, so what would you like to drink? Because uh, that's creepy. That's, that's when women fake a medical emergency and skip out on the date, right? First thing I said to my wife when we sat down for a first date was, hi, it's very nice to meet you. My name is Jeff. Uh, what exactly is it that you do? It was not an instant marriage proposal. It wasn't especially romantic. It wasn't even a good first line. Our marriage came from very humble beginnings, as I'm certain did yours, and as will your next big idea. So as you think about the need to evolve, adapt, and innovate, please keep this truth of innovation in mind. Your next big thing will begin as a small thing. And if you don't believe me, allow me to share with you a big thing that wasn't always a big thing, the Internet. I've done some research, and I have found out that this thing is popular. A lot of people using it these days. You should give it a shot if you haven't tried it out. I've heard people argue that the Internet is now as essential to our society as oxygen. And I agree with that. That's how big a deal it is. But it wasn't always that way. Internet has its origins back in 1961, and for years it was literally nothing but an idea about packet switching that got tossed around at tech conferences that a few dozen people attended. Eventually, that idea morphed 11 years later into a physical product. 1972, Jim certainly used these computers when he went to the first BEMA conference, probably. <laughs> exactly. This is, this is how big machines used to be. In 1972, first year that we debuted the ability of remote machines to communicate with one another and share information. 1972, also the year that we debuted the electronic mail which incidentally, its developers never thought would turn into what it is today. They never thought we would all have like six email addresses. They just thought of it as a way for ARPANET developers to talk to each other. Very slowly, over the next 20 years, throughout the 70s and 80s, thousands of people worked to refine ARPANET, each generally making very small incremental improvements that collectively turned the internet into something significant. Significant enough that on August 6th, 1991, 30 years after the idea first occurred to somebody, the World Wide Web went live to the entire world. This was the logo. They actually had a logo for it. They were trying to brand it. Cutting edge, early 90s graphics. And you know what? Nobody cared. Media didn't cover it. Nobody used it. It was a full year before the first picture got uploaded to the internet. This is the first photo that was ever put online. It's a CD cover sitting on some European researcher's desk who obviously did not think it was a historical moment. And do you want to know why it took a year for that picture to get uploaded? Because that's how long it used to take for things to upload. <laughs> for any young people in here who have no idea why the old people are laughing, there was a solid decade where everyone in the world who wanted to get online first had to say this, don't pick up the phone, please. 
Young people have no clue where the laughter is coming from. Why are they laughing? It's because the internet came in through your landline phone, and it prioritized phone calls. So if anybody in your house called out, or anybody called you while you were dialing in, it killed the connection. You had to start the whole stupid process over. So for any of you millennial Gen Z people who complain about slow audio movie download streaming speeds, uh, shut your mouth. <laughs> you do not know pain the way we know pain. In 1994, three years after the internet debuted, 11% of US households had it, and 68% of the ones that had it said they wouldn't care if they didn't have it, because in most cases it was given to them for free. It wasn't until 2001 that more than half of us got the internet in our homes. That is 40 years after the idea first occurred to somebody, and 10 years after the product was first available. So like I said, your next big thing will begin as a small thing. And most of those are going to stay small, and that's fine, because that's what most innovation is. Most innovation is about making small improvements. It's not about making big, giant, disruptive, massive things. But some small percentage of your small ideas will build and grow and compound until someday you're going to look back on them 10 years from now and wonder how you ever got by without them. So that is the first thing to understand about what innovation really is. No one is expecting you to come up with something that is instantaneously incredible and world-changing or if they are expecting it of you, or if you expect it of yourself, it is an unreasonable expectation. Your goal should be to come up with something that has the potential to be incredible and world-changing. Your goal should be to make small improvements that over time can grow into large improvements, or to make a tiny foray into a new market just to see what happens. That's what Delta did. I fly them a lot. And they began their career as a crop dusting company. Originally, their vision as a company was to eradicate a boll weevil population that was bothering southern farmers. Not exactly a global vision. And that's what they did for several years. And then eventually, somebody at the early Delta asked this question, what if we flew passengers during the off season? We have the planes. Nobody needs crop dusting in the winter. You know, what if we did that? And because somebody asked that question, 90 years later, Delta employs like 80,000 people. Which leads to our first step in your three-step process for coming up with your next big thing, ask a question. Every innovation begins with a question that is 100% true. Your question is either an attempt to solve an existing problem or an attempt to take advantage of a possible opportunity. But as long as you're asking questions and you have a place for innovation to grow from, if you're not asking any questions, there is simply no air for innovation to breathe. So we're going to look now at the questions that have led to some of today's most transformative innovations. We're going to look at three of them in depth from completely unrelated industries so that I can illustrate two things. Number one, each of these things, which completely overhauled its respective industry, exists because somebody somewhere asked a question. And number two, and this is the really important point, the questions that lead to our best innovations are not complicated. They are not hyper-technical. They're not questions that some of us could think up because we're geniuses and other people could never think up because they're not. They are extremely basic elementary school level questions that lead to the best innovations we have. We're going to begin with probably the most boring, but also I think the most useful, wheeled luggage. You used this innovation in order to get here to this hotel. We have wheels in our luggage, laptop cases, purses, small dogs, they make that thing. And all of us have this man to thank, Robert Plath, the former Northwest Airline pilot who built the first rollerboard in his garage workshop back in 1987. And before I really get into this, can I just say that it is amazing to me that we didn't get this stuff until the late 80s. Let us look at the chronology of human invention. We have the radio television, nuclear weapons, people in space, wheels on luggage. <laughs> That's the order. That's idiotic. We put wheels on the moon before we put it on luggage. But whatever, that was the order, right? And as a result of his invention, airport security lines were all reconfigured to allow the new luggage to pass through security. Airplanes were all built differently to house more carry-ons in the overhead bins. And this guy quit being an airline pilot to found Travel Pro, a luggage company that enjoyed double-digit growth for each of its first 10 years, in which in the 1990s was one of the fastest growing private companies in the United States. Before his invention, we would all go to the airport with our stupid hard-cased luggage and then put it on a cart with wheels. <laughs> the wheels were right there. Nobody thought to blob them together. 
except that that's not actually true. So the first patent for wheeled luggage goes all the way back to 1887. That's when Jim was born. I could not find, <laughs> could not find a picture of it uh, because there's not a lot of pictures from the 1880s. But it doesn't take off. And the reason for that is because the most popular form of transportation back then is by ship. So luggage needed to be really heavy in order to keep it from sliding in the hold as it goes over the water. So it's all lined with lead and iron. And the wheels just honestly don't add any functional mobility. Second patent comes in 1945, right after World War II. And here is a picture of the patent, which should look familiar to what we all use today. It only had two wheels instead of four. And it has the handle we use when we're not wheeling it, like we would still have today. And it also has the handle you use when you are wheeling it, which would have been great if your arms were like six feet long. Third patent comes in the early 70s. Some of you owned this one, the dog leash strap luggage, modeled, as you see here, by this high-powered, fashion-forward executive wearing a suit made out of carpet. <laughs> The 1970s, America's shameful decade. That outfit smells like every cigarette that has ever been smoked. <laughs> this is the luggage that doesn't stop when you do. So when you stop walking, it just keeps going. It hits you in the back of the leg. This one did make it into stores, but it was never ubiquitous. We did not all own the dog leash strap luggage. So what's the difference? Rollerboard, wildly successful. We all own six of them. How come that one took off, the other three didn't? It's not the wheels because they all have wheels, and we have been putting wheels onto things we have put stuff into since the Stone Ages. So the wheels are not especially innovative here, but that handle is, that handle lets you do with your luggage whatever you want, right? Pull it, push it, spin it in a circle, get rid of the handle when you don't want the handle. That right there is what made its founder hundreds of millions of dollars and overhauled a centuries old industry, a well-designed handle and the casters on the wheels that let them spin in 360 degrees. That's what did it. And the question that Robert Plath had to pose in order to think this up, not a complicated question. Is there a way to design wheeled luggage that would actually be comfortable to use? That's not a genius question. I don't mean to take anything away from him or his invention. I didn't think it up. All I'm trying to say is that any one of us could have thought that question up. Some of y'all probably did when you were in the airport back in the day, you know, with your stupid hard case luggage looking for a wheelie cart thinking there's got to be a better way. So we're going to move on now to our second in our three-part series of big, giant innovations uh, that come from very simple questions. Slightly different product now. We're going to talk about Viagra, which is often found in luggage. That's the tie-in here, OK? <laughs> There's some of it in this hotel. Anyway, Viagra, as I'm sure you know, created an entirely new class of pharmaceuticals. Since its introduction in 1998, it has been Pfizer's number one selling drug for every single year, except maybe for the coronavirus vaccine they had a couple years ago. So number one selling drug for at least 20 years, uh, $19 billion in sales in the last decade alone, a staggering number of little blue pills. This stuff was so popular that eventually other drug companies started trying to copy them. That's where you got the we like bathing but not in the same tub people, and where you get the let's throw a football through a tire swing. Like that commercial was thought up by a 15-year-old boy. You've got the, hey, ladies, why don't you come to my house? I mean, seriously, look at that guy. <laughs> so, don't. Go to his house, OK? Like, <laughs> he's, he's going to murder you. <laughs> and then last but not least, we've got Smiling Bob. You'll remember him, right? Mr. Enzite, he's happy because he's working in more ways than one. This stuff has been a really big deal. But it shouldn't have been. Viagra honestly shouldn't even exist. Because as some of you maybe know, it was originally developed in 1989, a decade before it hit the market as a treatment for high blood pressure. Now this is a drug space that already had a lot of drugs in it. So Pfizer's not trying to create a whole new type of drug. They're not honestly trying to be all that innovative. They are trying to cannibalize an existing market. They're trying to be an also ran. So they spent years testing Viagra's efficacy as a blood pressure medication only to learn that it didn't really work, it wasn't very good. And so it was well on its way to being another in a long list of failed drugs, which in the pharma world is normal. Nine out of 10 drugs don't make it to market. So it would have been totally normal for them to say, listen, it failed human trials, kill the project, let's stop pouring money down this dead end, and let's put it into whatever's next in the pipeline. That is their normal process, what they always did. It's what they should have done with Viagra, except that patients were reporting uh, side effects. Uh, something interesting, something kind of neat something they wanted to experience again and again and again, which is really not your typical response to drug side effects. When was the last time you saw a drug commercial that said possible side effects include feeling amazing? <laughs> Never. 
It's always horrible stuff. Possible side effects include massive bleeding, brain hemorrhaging, leprosy. Ask your doctor about traxepam. It's always bad stuff. It's never that. So, Pfizer scientists took their rather unusual patient survey data and they asked themselves a very simple question. Can we redirect this failing drug to target a different medical population? Or if you really want to drill it down, what they really said was, can we maybe make some money off this thing? And because somebody asked, because somebody said, wait a second, before we do what we always do, just wait, hold on. Because somebody did that, it's been worth billions of dollars, created an entirely new line of pharmaceutical medications, and had an undeniable impact on the lives of millions of people. We're going to move on now to our third in our three-part series of big, giant things that come from very basic places. Uh, we're going to get a little more high-tech, I suppose, and talk a little bit about iTunes, which I know is gone now, folded into Apple Music. But when this debuted on January 9th, 2001, it completely overhauled the way you and I consume music. You now no longer had to power through those three crappy songs on your favorite band's album because the label said they needed 12 tracks instead of nine. Now, you couldn't get tricked into buying a whole album based on the strength of a single only to find out that all the other songs were garbage. I'm talking to you, Vanilla Ice. I'm still mad about it, and I bought the cassette tape. I was OG Vanilla Ice. Now, you only bought whatever you wanted. This model of single item purchasing, as opposed to having to buy an entire suite of products, is also credited with changing the way that you and I consume movies and TV. So, HBO On Demand, Hulu, the unbundling of cable packages, all of this can be traced back here to one of the most noticeable technological innovations of the last 20 years. An innovation that Apple barely deserves any credit for because they in no way created downloading music or streaming media. That had been around for a decade already, completely illegally, the way music is supposed to be listened to. Some of you will remember some of the more popular of the file sharing services of the mid and late 90s. We had Freenet, Kazaa, BearShare, Nutella, which is delicious, by the way. It is excellent on toast. And then you had LimeWire, Grokster, Aimster, and, of course, Napster. Y'all know. Show of hands, and you can't get arrested for this. Statute of limitations is well past. Exactly. How many of you use these? Exactly. If you were in college when this was available, you used it. At one point, audio MP3 downloads accounted for 61% of all college internet network traffic, which is a large part of the reason that universities fought so hard against Napster and similar services, because we were using their internet to download so much illegal music that no one could get online to learn anything. You know who else fought really hard against Napster? was Metallica. And I have to say, these two here, unlikely allies. It is difficult to picture them vacationing together, but that's what I think it would look like. Anyway. Napster was the most popular, but they all did the exact same thing. They all let you download anything you wanted, and they all let you do it for free. And they all got sued for copyright violation, and they all went out of business. Napster was only around for two years, which is impressive for a company whose name is still synonymous for a lot of us with illegal file sharing. So here's what Apple did. They did nothing. They did nothing for 10 years. They were a hardware company, not a software company. They did nothing for a decade. They looked at this and then asked this question. Is there a way to create a legal avenue for downloading music? Because that's all iTunes was. They took an existing landscape. They developed licensing agreements with the record companies. That's what stopped the lawsuits. They charged us money, and that's it. So really what they asked was, is it possible to trick people into paying for something they're currently getting for free? The answer was a gigantic yes. They didn't even build the software iTunes is based on. They bought SoundJam MP, an audio software program developed in July of 1998 by two former Apple employees. They bought it. They hired those guys back. And that's why we have our Apple Music and Spotify and Beats and Pandora and whatever streaming service you're using right now. The point I'm trying to get at with these three examples, and I could pick a billion others in any industry I wanted, is that every innovation in every industry, every big thing everywhere, exists because somebody somewhere asked a super basic question. Coffee cup holders, how can I keep from burning the crap out of myself when I drink coffee out of a paper cup? Guy who invented those sells about a billion of them a year. The Marshall Plan, how can we avoid the mistakes of the Versailles Treaty and prevent the possibility of World War III? Reality television, do you think people might enjoy making fun of idiots in hot tubs? <laughs> the answer is a gigantic yes. The Weather Channel, do you think people might enjoy watching the weather on TV all day long? Stare at that question for a second, because that's the stupidest thing anybody's ever asked. It's so dumb, but it works. 
It's a thing. My wife will look at the weather on her phone now long before it occurs to her to look out the window. She's just like, I, w I wonder what the weather's like. I'm like, it's there. You can even touch it. It's interactive. So ask a question. That's all you have to do to get your innovation started. And if by any miracle you don't have a single question bouncing around in your head, I got 11 of them for you right now. You do not need to write these down. I'm going to go too fast for you to do that. You can get this list later. And I do not work in the baking or in the manufacturing sectors. I do not have a deep, intensive understanding of the work that you do. But I am very, very confident that any one of these questions would be fantastic places for you to start innovating, even though I do not have your industry expertise. So for example, what are some interesting things our competitors are doing that we should maybe copy? If our core business suddenly stopped making money, how else might we generate revenue? What frustrates our customers, and what can we do to fix it? What are some ideas that we tried in the past that we should maybe revisit? How can we improve employee engagement? How can we make ourselves more attractive to highly skilled applicants who have a lot of job opportunities to choose from? What's one process that slows me down every day, and what can I do to improve it? What do I wish our company did that we do not currently do? If I had an unlimited budget, how would I spend it? What is one skill I do not currently have that would help me move forward in my career? And this last one, which is true for all of us in everything we do, not just at work, but at home as well. Why do we do things the way we do them, and might there be a better way? I'm very confident that you have asked yourself some of these questions before, and I'm equally confident that you have questions I didn't just list. And what that means is that you're already innovating. You are already in this process, and you will continue to be innovating for as long as questions occur to you. Now, very, very occasionally, this is the part of the innovative process where we get stuck. Very, uh, very occasionally, we kind of stop before we start. Sometimes it's because we lie to ourselves and say there's nothing to ask. I have answered everything, but I feel like this list effectively blows that myth up. More commonly, if this is where you're getting stuck, it's not because you don't know there's questions. You, you probably do know there are questions. You probably know exactly what they are, and you just don't want to look at them. And if that describes you or anyone you work with, I'd like to share a story from my own life that will hopefully be useful in helping you overcome this hurdle. So my mother, wonderful mom, single mother, have a huge amount of respect for single parents, raised two amazing kids and my brother, but whatever, nobody's perfect, you know? And uh, two out of three ain't bad, Meatloaf taught me that. Uh, that's for the old people, by the way. Uh, that's young people like Meatloaf. No, that's awesome. Bob Colson from Fight Club, Paradise by the Dashboard Lights, killer song, look it up. Anyway, my point, is not meatloaf. My point is that my mom's a great mom, and I have a lot of respect for her. But she hated personal finance, hated thinking about money. So she didn't. We didn't have anybody coming to repossess the house, so everything's probably fine. That's how my mom operated. Till about four years before she wanted to retire, she'd started making noises about, you know, maybe someday I'm going to stop working. And so I said, well, we should sit down and figure out what that looks like for you financially. You know, budget things out, see if you're all right. And she did not want to do this at all. Uh, and I had, to, I had to help her with it, and I had to get her password so I could look at her accounts and figure out how she was doing. And it was a very, very frustrating experience, because every time I asked her a question, I got the same answer. How much do you owe in the house? I don't know. How much do you owe in your car? I don't know. How much do you have in the bank? I don't know. How much do you have in your 401k? I don't know. She didn't know anything, and she didn't want to help me. And it was like, it was honestly, it was like dealing with a child. Every eight minutes, she's like, I don't want to do this anymore. And it was, we were getting heated. And eventually, I found the thing to say that kind of broke through and moved us forward. And hopefully, this will be useful to you if you're struggling with this again for yourself or with anybody else. I finally said to my mom, listen, mom, not thinking about this is not going to make it go away. And the same thing is true for you. The questions that represent the problems that you face or the opportunities that you have, they're there whether you ask them or not. The only thing that asking them does is gives you agency. It gives you a chance to do something about it instead of just sitting back and waiting for the world to do whatever the world chooses to do. And as I'm sure you know, the world has a habit of occasionally doing things to us that we kind of wish it didn't. So in other words, the difference between taking charge of your life or letting life take charge of you is whether or not you're asking questions. So that's the first step. Ask a question. Super basic question. Elementary school level question. Get your innovation off the ground. Step number two is to think about possible answers to that question, which should be obvious. Got a question, you're going to need an answer. So this should be the easiest part of the whole process. But this is where we usually get stuck. This is where we usually stall. 
And it's not because you're not smart. It's not because you can't think. You guys do work that I very much appreciate. I love eating, but I barely comprehend how you make it happen. I was going through your magazines and looking at some of the equipment that you sell, and it's just all magic. It's just incredible. So it's not that we can't think. It's that we have a tendency not to value thought because it doesn't look like work. Because if you come to where I'm working, you see me typing on a computer, I'm on a phone call, that guy's working, I'm being productive. But if you come to where I'm working, I'm just sitting there, you know, with a far off look in my eyes, and you're like, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, I'm thinking so hard. Yeah, the thoughts are just exploding. You're not gonna believe me. You're gonna think I'm screwing off, wasting my time practicing my dumb and dumber impression. You're not gonna think that I'm doing anything useful in that moment. That is the biggest problem with creative thought. It doesn't look like anything. We have a tendency to value work that looks productive over work that doesn't look productive, even though thinking about how to answer our questions is one of the most productive things we can do. Because it takes a while. I gave you this list of questions about three minutes ago, and you have no good answers for it yet, because you haven't had a chance to think about any of them. And it takes a while. Nobody has ever said, oh, I took a shower, I now know how we can make an extra billion dollars. That's not how it works, it takes some time. And most of us do not feel empowered while we are working to kick back and think about how to answer our questions. And it may be the case that you can't do this while you're working. You may be going into your office or you may be sitting down at your computer from the time you start working to the time you log off and you're just busy. You're dealing with things. You have a lot to do. Everybody's being asked to do more with less. You may be, you may be saying, I cannot do this during my regular working day. I have too much other stuff to do. And that may be true. But even if you can't do it there, I know you can do it in other places. Because I don't know you, and I don't know your habits. But I do know that the vast majority of your best ideas have historically come to you in the exact same places that my best ideas come to me. So in the shower, or while you're exercising, maybe while you're on a long walk, hopefully avoiding the alligators that are all around here or maybe when you're lying in bed at 3 a.m. because you can't get to sleep and know you're gonna be awake for another hour, or maybe when you're driving cross country to do a family visit or just your daily commute, anywhere where you give your brain permission to wander. For most of us, this is where our best ideas come. Sometimes they come with what feel like flashes of insight. Sometimes they come when we've been chewing on an idea for days or weeks or months or even years, but they overwhelmingly come when we are not otherwise mentally occupied and therefore able to devote ourselves to thinking about how to answer whatever questions we are asking. This is the heart of innovation, giving ourselves the time to think about how to answer our questions, and it really is this easy. Every time we give ourselves the time, the answers come. They always do. And so now, you might be thinking, if it's really that easy, how come I don't feel very innovative? And for this, I need you to do me a favor that a couple of you may already have done because you think I'm boring. I need you to take your phones out, please, or your computers, your laptops, tablets. Just take something out. And a couple of you, immediate obedience. I love it. You're like, oh, God, I missed you. I'm so sorry. Thank you. They made me put you away. I want you to take your phone out because I want you to do something in just a second. And I don't care what you do. I don't care if you, you know, answer your email. I don't care if you film a TikTok video. I don't care, all right? I'm going to keep talking, and I'm going to put some pictures up here that you maybe want to look at, but I genuinely want you to do something on your device while I continue talking because that's how I'm going to make the point I'm going to make. We're going to do this for about 90 seconds, all right? So pick something you can do in 90 seconds. And I know you can scroll through news headlines in 90 seconds. I know you can do a social media post in 90 seconds. I know you can play a level of video game in 90 seconds. I'm going to take a drink of water, all right? And then I'm going to let you all lock in. And I want this place to feel like an airport. Lots of people near each other, nobody interacting with anybody. So, OK. Ah, delicious. OK. <sighs> Here we go. The Magna Carta was signed in 1215 and is considered to be the first legal document establishing personal liberties. This is a picture of a panda. Pacifiers have been around for centuries and have occasionally been added out of ivory, bone, coral, silver, which is where the phrase bone with a silver spoon comes from, and white rubber, which contained lead. Not a very good thing for a baby to put in his mouth. When I was 15 years old, I broke my right leg and my left wrist in a motorcycle accident. I'd like to lie to you and say I was jumping over a canyon or evading the police, but I just fell into a ditch. Got me to go into homecoming, which saved me some money, but did not make my girlfriend happy. And by the way, can you believe that that had a girlfriend? That is me at 15 years old. That's why I'm so mad at Vanilla Ice. I'm obviously trying to copy his haircut. But listen, the point I'm trying to make is never give up hope. Somebody dated me, so if you're single, I guarantee somebody's going to be into you. 
New Zealand was the first country in the world to allow women to vote. Massachusetts the first state to allow gay marriage. And my first word was toboggan. I was a precocious child, but I'm also lying about that. But I'm not lying about any of the following facts. Abraham Lincoln was a nearly undefeated wrestler during his lifetime. The French were still using the guillotine as late as 1977. And pickle juice is an amazing chaser for tequila. Kills the burn of the tequila and does not taste like pickle juice. Give it a shot the next time you take a shot. But if last up the weird taste in your mouth, here's a picture of a sloth, the most adorable creature ever. I want to be one. Okay. That was about 70 seconds. So do me a favor, put your phones away, please. And I'm going to ask some questions. I'm not going to call on you. Just show of hands here, thing, so I can get my point across. Show of hands. How many of you feel even remotely dizzy after that experience? Even a little bit. All right. 20, 25%. That's typical. Because you got two stimuli hitting you at the same time, that can be very disorienting. Show of hands. How many of you feel like you're able to effectively focus on your device? If you sent an email and placed an order, you're really confident that was a good decision. Not so many. How many of you were able to focus on me? If I gave you a quiz on those random disconnected facts, you'd get, you know, 70, 80%. Okay. Well, I know the Venn diagram between not much and not much. How many of you were able to do both of these things at the same time very effectively and didn't sacrifice any sweet or fading juice? I have done this for thousands of different people, pretty much any industry you can think of, and it's always the same. It's always the same. And this right here is the reason that we think innovation is hard. It's not because you can't think. Uh, it's not because you're not smart. You guys do essential work, so important, and it's so complicated. <laughs> the, the logistics involved in you getting your products to places where people like me can eat it and I don't have to go farm it or kill it myself is just staggering. It's not that we can't think. It's that we lie to ourselves. All of us genuinely believe that we are masters of multitasking, that we can do two or three or five things at the same time without sacrificing speed or efficiency. We brag sometimes about how many balls we have in the air all at once. And all of us are lying. When you're working on a thing and you get interrupted, here's what you do. You stop working on this thing, you deal with this thing, and when that's done, you come back to this thing. We do not do them both at once. The only instances in which our brains are even capable of doing two things at the same time is when one of those things requires so little thought that our brains can go on autopilot. This would include things like long walks over level ground where you're not paying attention to your footing, which is why you're going to have an easier time being innovative on a walk around your block than you will on a walk through the swamp where the alligators might eat you, because you're going to pay a little more attention on that walk than you do around your block. This is uh, when we uh, do certain kinds of exercise, when we do long, monotonous car trips where we don't have to GPS the route because we've been there a thousand times. Incidentally, most of the places where our best ideas historically come to us. In these moments, we engage a part of our brain called the anterior cingulate cortex, which is essentially responsible for paying attention to our environment for us so that we don't get eaten by something while we are you know, mentally occupied. This is the part of our brain that allows us to keep driving while we're daydreaming. And I know you've been there before, snapped out of it, and realized you just went 10 miles, don't remember any of them. This is the part of your brain that allows us to keep showering ourselves while we're thinking about something else. And I know you've been there before, snapped out of that, and had to ask yourself, did I actually use the shampoo? <laughs> I don't know. You have to look at the bar of soap. There are suds on it. I did clean myself. Okay, I can get out now. I'm not alone. This part of our brain disengages any time a new stimulus is introduced. Anything from a strange shape over at the corner of our vision to glancing down at our phones to receive an incoming text, which is incidentally the biological reason that texting and driving is so dangerous. Because the act of looking at the phone, whether we read or respond to it, the act of looking at it disengages the autopilot that's paying attention to traffic for us. And in a tight traffic environment, that two, three, five second disengagement can be the difference between an accident and not an accident. The point I'm trying to get at is that we have created a world through our various inventions and technologies that allows us to be mentally occupied 24-7. And we cannot innovate while we're doing other things. While we're watching TV and trying to follow the plot of a show, or while we're scrolling through social media to see what's up with people, or playing Angry Crush or Candy Birds or whatever game you're on right now. I'm not saying that we shouldn't do these things. It's fine to do these things. It's good to be entertained. It's good to be distracted. Sometimes it's good to shut your brain entirely off. What I'm saying is that while we are doing these things, we cannot innovate. It is not possible. Our brains are not built to do two things at the same time. So if you want to speed up, if you want to see yourself personally or your company as a whole blowing past your competition because you are coming up with new and better ideas at a faster rate than others, if this is in any way important to you, you first have to slow down. 
And I know that looks like a contradiction, but it's the truth. Because your best ideas are going to come to you in moments where it looks like nothing's happening. They're going to come at events like the jamboree last night. When you're having a couple drinks and just having a conversation, a messy, meandering conversation with some colleagues about a problem you're facing in your business or a thing you've thought about doing maybe and you want to just flesh it out. And there is no better proof of the truth of this statement than the pandemic. Because in March of 2020, uniquely in human history, every business, every family, every person on the planet all got shoved the same question into their face. What the hell do I do with this? All of us all had the same question. We had to answer it. We didn't want to, and we had to. And we did in a lot of different ways. And some of the things we came up with during the pandemic, they just got us through the pandemic, and we don't do those things anymore. But some of the things we came up with, we found out those are actually pretty good practices. And we're still doing them, even though we don't you know, need to do them because of the pandemic anymore. We're going to look back, if you haven't already, we're going to look back at the pandemic as the most innovative time in living memory, because we had no choice. The world forced us to answer a question we did not want to answer, and we did. And if we can do it when the world forces it on us, we can do it anytime we want. So step number one, ask a question, basic question. Step number two, give yourself some undistracted time to think about how to answer your question. And then step number three, do whatever you thought of. That's it. It's so easy that it's almost embarrassing to put here, but this is the step that everyone's an expert at. Every single one of us knows how to work towards a goal once we know what the goal is. And in this respect, there is essentially zero difference between business as usual, which requires us to do work, and pursuing an innovative solution, which requires us to do work. The work we do might be different, but the act of working, that's exactly the same. And I know you all know how to work, and I also know you all know how to pivot on a dime when something or someone else makes you. So really, all I'm asking with step three is this. Which would you prefer? To only do what other people or outside forces require of you, or to occasionally do what you think should be done, and better yet, convince other people that what you think should be done actually should be done and get them to do it too. That right there is the most fundamental pleasure of human existence, convincing other people that our ideas are right. And you want to know why I know that? Because I am married. <laughs> and my wife loves trying to get me to do what she thinks I should do. She is endlessly innovative at coming up with ways that I could improve myself. I'll give you an example. This will hit home for some of you. When I am not traveling, I work out of my house. And it is the only room in my house that is mine. And I think a lot of married men have this situation. We get a room in our house for ourselves. And a lot of times, that's an unfinished part of the house. So, right? You have the garage or the shed out back or the basement that is, smells like mold and death. And they're like, enjoy the man cave, right? Usually, that's what it is. But I have an office and it's on the main level of the house, and I use it for my job. And my job pays for the house my whole family lives in, which I feel like is an important point. And, <laughs> and my wife wants uh, curtains in it because the house is on the main level, and she wants the whole main level to be tied together aesthetically. She has a vision for how my office is supposed to look, and I don't want any curtains in my office. I want one room in my own home. I think I deserve one room in my own house that doesn't have any live, laugh, love crap anywhere in it. <laughs> I am so sick of in, in, in Instagram posts and Pinterest and chalkboard paint and reclaimed barn wood and shabby chic, whatever the hell that means. And the worst for me are the signs that pretend to be art that tell you what the room you're in is for. We have those all over the house. Happy families do laundry. Well, what the hell does that mean? <laughs> Unhappy families also clean their clothes. We have a sign in our living room that says gather. I'm like, oh, that's what this room is for. Oh, super helpful. I thought it was for bullfighting. I was so <laughs> confused. Now I know. She's won the whole house. I want one room without that stuff. So we had a conversation. I said, listen, we agreed when we bought the house that I was going to get one room in it that was for my office, which, by the way, pretty nice concession on my part because our house has more than two rooms. I don't want half of the house. I want 11% of the house, and this is the part I want. You don't even come in here. 100% of the people who use this room are me, okay? 
so I don't want curtains. I was super polite about it. So we got the curtains, because <laughs> duh. I mean, everybody saw that coming, right? Yeah. After a year, I'm so proud of me. I held out for a year, but she's just like a woodpecker, just curtains, curtains, curtains. <laughs> Drilling it in. Eventually, I'm just like, shut up. You can have them. And you know, the worst part of the whole thing is uh, they look good. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. The women always applaud. She was right. <laughs> Do you want to know why I just spent three minutes outlining my not 100% uh, true, not embellished at all, year long argument with my wife about curtains for my office? It is to point out that you are endlessly innovative in your personal life. This process, you do it every day at home. Because problems come up at home whether you're looking for them or not. Opportunities come up whether you're looking for them or not. Uh, how are we going to save enough money to send the kids to college? Or uh, should we move so that we can be closer to your parents? I don't, I don't know what they are, but they come up. And when they do, what do you do? You do the same thing everyone else on the planet does. You talk about it. And maybe it's one conversation and maybe it's 20. And maybe it's easy and maybe you fight. But at the end of that, you come up with a plan and you execute the plan. And if everything works, then great. Problem solved, opportunity taken advantage of, move on with life. But if it doesn't work, you revisit the situation with new information, you have a new collection of conversations, you come up with a different strategy and you execute that. You have been doing this for forever in your personal life and it's no different at work. It's no different today than it was 10,000 years ago. People have a tendency to talk about innovation like it's a skill that some people have and other people don't. Hey, listen, I'm very innovative and you aren't. Allow me to teach you how to re-engineer your brain for maximum creativity. That is condescending and insulting. You want innovation in four words? Just the whole process. Ask, think, do, and repeat. That's it. That's all it ever has been. You've been doing it your entire life and you can do it with anything you want. So my goal today is to try to demystify, uncomplicate, simplify a process and a concept that I think is often made overly complicated and make sure that you walk out of here feeling very, very comfortable, that you are able to handle the challenge of coming up with interesting solutions and solving whatever problems you've got, taking advantage of whatever opportunities are on your horizon. What I want to do now, though, is start to make this a little bit more directly applicable to you. So. I'm going to go through this process with something that might be useful for you, all right? So I'm going to start with the question. That's the question that I picked. How can we improve employee engagement? So that's step one. And then if anything I say in the next like seven, eight minutes is useful to you, I want you to remember that it all comes from me doing what I just said. So I picked the question, then I thought about how to answer it, and then I said those words out loud. So if any of this works for you, that's where it comes from, just following this process. So. Uh, you may know for the last 10, 15 years, very consistently, survey after survey shows across all industries that approximately two-thirds of us are disengaged at work. You may have heard this before. It's a very common statistic to share. What I don't think is quite as commonly shared is at the exact same time that two-thirds of us are disengaged at work, two-thirds of us are satisfied at work. And I thought that was weird. How can most of us be satisfied and disengaged at the same time? How can that be possible? And I think the reason for this is because of the way we typically conceive of what effective leadership looks like. Because if you've been to a leadership conference or read books about it or anything like that, you probably have, it is very generically, typically presented in a binary system. So very, very basically, there's a bunch of things you could do that would make you a good leader. There's a different bunch of things you could do that would make you a bad one. Do the good stuff, avoid the bad stuff, you'll be fine. I think that's how it's usually presented. And if you do that, I think you get what we have. I think you get a lot of satisfied, disengaged people. So I would like to reconceive of what effective leadership requires because I think there are two equally important pieces of effective leadership. The first I'm calling human leadership. This is the part of leadership where you're making people feel like they're valued members of the team, that you respect them as individuals. And the second half, equally important, is vision and mission leadership. This is the part of leadership where you're getting people to buy into what you do and why you do it, the value that it brings to the world. Both of these are critical in order to have engaged employees. And the reason that I'm saying this is because several years ago, ADP, the big giant payroll processor, 
crunched uh, the data from a huge survey put out by the Society of Human Resource Managers. And it was about 300,000 people who responded to their survey, and it was, it was everybody. It was every age, every ethnicity, you know, entry level to C-suite, every industry. Just a big, giant cross-section of the working world. And they crunched that data, and they found these to be, in order, the top six motivators of engaged employees. And if you look at this list, and you can answer yes to all of these things. I like the work I do. I like who I work with. I'm able to do what I'm good at. I like who I report to. I think my work makes a difference here. And I'm able to do that job the way I like to. If you can say yes to all six of these things, odds are you would describe yourself as an engaged employee. And obviously, this is what we want for uh, the people that we lead as well, right? And if you look at this, two of these things deal 100% with issues of what I'm calling human leadership, of making people feel valued and respected as individuals. And two of these things deal 100% with issues of what I'm calling vision and mission. It is very, very difficult to be engaged if you think, well, people like me here, but this job is pointless. And it's equally difficult to be engaged if you think, you know, we're saving the world and feeding the nations, but they would replace me with a robot if they could figure out how. That is why both pieces of leadership need to be happening simultaneously in order for you to have an engaged workforce. And right now, it might look like I'm asking you to do six different things, which does seem kind of like a heavy lift. So I'm going to try to drill this down as simply as I possibly can. Because these two here, if you really drill it down, all you're saying is, I like you. I'm glad you're here. I think it's great that you're a part of our team. That's all you're really saying. These two here, what you're saying is, the work we do makes a difference. This stuff matters. And all you're saying with these two here is, I think you can handle the job. I know you're up to the challenge. I like you. The work we do is important. And I know you can handle that work. Those three pillars of engagement are really all there is. And there's a million different ways to say or show any one of these three things. I'm not going to sit here and try to talk to you about specifically how you should do that. That is yours. You know your people better than I do. And you know how it makes the most sense for you to get this point across. But if on a regular basis you can figure out how to say, I like you, the work we do is important, and I know you can handle that work, you figure out how to say or show those three things on a regular basis, you, I think, will see much higher engagement out of your people than maybe you do right now. So that is hopefully a useful way to think about leadership and how to drive employee engagement. And again, if any of that is useful to you, then remember, it all comes from me following that three-step innovative process. So now, it's your turn. So here's what I have done. On every table underneath the flowers or underneath the mints, there is a piece of paper with a question on it. And each table is going to be its own group. There's a couple back in the back, so you people don't get out of this either. And here's what's going to happen. For about, uh, about 15 minutes, uh, I want you just to talk with each other about how to answer the question that is on that piece of paper. And there's two things that you can kind of think about. One is, what are some things we've done recently that have successfully answered this question? And one is, what could we do in the future that we're not currently doing that would help answer this question? I want you to spend 15 minutes talking with, with each other. I need one secretary per table. And in 15 minutes, I'm going to come around and start asking you to share a couple of your ideas and thoughts. I'm pretty sure you know what you need to do. If anybody has any questions, let me know. But the next 15 minutes are yours. And we have done our 15 minutes. Let's see, we got this one. Perfect. All right. I would like you to wrap up your conversations, please. I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you found something useful. And I am now, I am now going to come around and, uh, well, I'm going to ask first. I'm going to ask if there's any tables who would be willing to share one or two of the thoughts, like the question they had, and then one or two of the thoughts that they came up with. If you're not willing, I'm going to make you do it anyway. Uh, so it'd be easier if this is voluntary, but it doesn't have to be. Who would like to start? Anybody? I will come around with the microphone. Somebody over there. Perfect. Thank you very much. Here we go. The lady in the back. What was your question and one or two things that you all thought up? Our question was, what do I wish our company or industry did that we don't currently do. So we had a very healthy conversation about technology over here. Uh, we were talking about how we'd like to see applications be used to monitor the production in your bakery line and how we go about doing it, what's available, what data is available to make that happen. And I was saying, 
I think we need to get a technology industry into our industry to marry with what we're, all the initiatives that we're doing because it'd be great. How many of you would love to be looking at your phone? Not during his session, <laughs> but look at your phone and be able to see what's happening back at home on your production line. Or if you have something that's down, how much is it costing you? And just do that right from your phone. How much do we do from our phone, right? So we talked how that could be possible and what it would take for our industry to bring that in. Oh, that's fantastic. I mean, I can, yeah, oh, go ahead, yes, applause, yes. Sorry. I can, I can see, I can see a future BEMA conference where you have, uh, you know, different or vendors and like just a broader collection of, of people who are here as well to make it, it more comprehensive. Yes, uh, it looks like you got voted it, sir. Uh, your question and then one or two things that you discussed. Our question was how can we improve our customer experience? So we came up with a lot of answers and we thought, well, we've got a customer here. Let's ask him. So customer came over. We asked him, and he said, get rid of you, <laughs> talking about me. <laughs> That's true. And so uh, we took that to mean, got to be willing to ask a tough question. And even if you get the answer that you don't want to hear, you have to listen to it. That is good, and I uh, congratulate you on your final BEMA conference. So, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Excellent, uh, but yes, no, I mean, asking tough questions, listening to answers, even if you don't like them, fantastic advice, not just for work, but also dealing with those moronic people you chose to marry and then create. <laughs> it's true for personal lives as well. Your turn, sir. All right, so our question was, what is one skill I should consider developing or improving on in order to help my performance or advance my career? We've got a pretty diverse cross-section at our table, and we kind of settled in on communication, right? I mean, it's the one skill set across all industries, across all disciplines that impacts everything, improving your communication. Um, and, and not so much just the way you deliver, but understanding how the recipient is processing that knowledge. If you're able to understand how they're receiving the information, you have a greater opportunity to get the impact and the result that you want, which may be not complete agreement with what you're saying, but giving them the opportunity to then give you feedback on maybe a, a way to innovate or approach the problem a little differently. So communication was the universal. Perfect, thank you very much. And uh, I, I talked at a lot of conferences, of course, in the last several years, I don't know, or several months rather, uh, AI and how it's going to impact the industry is pretty standard conversation at pretty much every conference we go to. And one of the questions, that, or one of the topics that always comes up is what can and can't it do? And when you're getting into that like active listening, emotional intelligence like you're just describing, that's something that there's really no technological uh, you know, fix for or shortcut for. And it's one of the things that people, I think, are always going to be, you know, the experts at. And the better you are at it, the more effective you're probably going to be as a team player and as a leader. Uh, who would like to go next? Yes, sir. Same deal. Question and one or two things you thought the of. The question was, what did the pandemic teach us about our business and industry, and how can we use that to improve going forward? And we thought that the pandemic taught us that the food industry is essential and enduringly profitable over history. And... The pandemic caused, uh, taught us that renewed focus can reduce waste and help us reach stretch goals. And to improve that going forward, we think that it uh, gives us a risk-free environment for more capital, and it gives us some insurance to take long-term risks for, uh, for hiring and for innovation. That is fantastic. And I think in every industry, it doesn't, or every job, doesn't matter what industry, it's easy to uh, get into patterns and settle into what just feels normal, right? And, and that is not only true with the way your business operates, but also the way you think about your business. And so, you know, uh, you've been making food forever. You've been feeding people forever. You're the reason everyone's alive for forever. But it's easy to forget that because you do it so often and you do it so automatically that you can kind of lose sight of the meaningfulness of the work that you do. And then a situation like the pandemic comes up and kind of refocuses you on, oh yeah, this is like actually critical stuff and hopefully gives you a renewed sense of how important your job is. And then of course, obviously the operational side, it forced everybody to think about that as well. So I think it's, I think it's great sometimes to be hopefully not forced like the pandemic did, but to occasionally refocus and rethink about what is it that we do? How is this meaningful? How can we, you know, asking those questions on a repeated basis so that you get personal satisfaction and obviously operational efficiency as well. This half of the room is very quiet. It's like middle school. You're the people sitting in the back. So, oh, perfect. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm coming for you guys next. Okay. It's my son's name. Well chosen. <laughs> 
But our question was, what's something our company or industry does that we should maybe stop doing? So we, we, we came up with actually quite a few different ideas. <laughs> and and re really, sort of the crux of it was, was all what we termed, I think, called the old tapes. So people were always pulling out sort of the, the old tapes or, or the, the old lines of, yeah, because we've always done it that way, or we, we, we've tried that before and it didn't work. And sort of, uh, you know, we need to open our minds, come up with, with reasons why things didn't work, come up with solutions, stop complaining, come up with a solution, and, and f think of different ways and have the resilience to try it different ways to make it happen. So uh, anything in, anyone else <coughs> like to add? No, it's perfect, yeah. and al always, always important. Uh, business is always engaged in like a constant struggle between doing what's always worked and then trying to anticipate what the future is going to require. And it's difficult because the things that have, like the, the way we've always done it, that's what has, everybody who's worked there for a long time, it's what's made them successful. It's what's brought them their success. Uh, so you don't want to give it up necessarily, but that doesn't mean you can do business the same way as you did five, ten years ago because things are constantly evolving. So it's a difficult dance, and it's important to be asking those questions all the time. Do these practices still make sense? Are there things we could be doing that are better? Sometimes the answer is going to be yes, sometimes it's going to be no. Uh, we're going to do one more over here, and there's a guy with a big hat, so he's very visible. <laughs> so it's you. It's you. I met you last night. You have a firm handshake, sir. Yes. All right. Our question was, how can we better attract and retain top talent? And the first thing we discussed as a group was reputation of your company, because that's the first thing they're going to recognize. The second one was uh, ultimately making sure that you make it family engaged because the family keeps the people in the door. And also making sure your talent feels recognized for what they do. And it's not always about money with everybody. Sometimes they're actually more incentivized by having more time off, right? Or just feeling more appreciated for what they're bringing to the table. So knowing your talent, knowing what they want, and making sure you have a custom retaining plan, not just a retaining plan. That's perfect. Thank you very much. And, and yeah, applause for everybody. <laughs> a, 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 couple, a couple comments on that. I, so I go to lots and lots of conferences, and most of them actively discourage family <laughs> from attending. You know, it's like, this is my getaway. Let's go drink. And you guys, you guys also drink, but with your kids, which I think is, I think is great. <laughs> But no, like I said, I got to go to the, the Jamboree last night. I actually sat behind your grandparents, I think. They had the 14-month-old, uh, I don't know if it's your son or if it's your nephew. Brother. It's your brother. Oh, that little baby's your brother? 14-month-old's <laughs> your brother? You're kidding. Wow. Uh, good for your parents, like one way or another. Good for you guys. Okay. Yeah. All right, well. <laughs> well, one of you was a surprise. <laughs> so, anyway, so you and your brother, that's super cool. But the, the fact that that wasn't expected. So the, uh, I was like, the, the fact that you, you have your family here, that you encourage your family to be here, that your kids know each other, as you were saying, that's a big draw, you know, for a lot of people. But I want to talk about the first point you said when you're talking about reputation, because a lot, of, a lot of industries, most of the industries I talk to, they will say some version of, it's hard to get people here because we're not sexy. And they typically think of sexy as like, there's like four companies. It's like you could work at Google or Apple or some company that has like massage parlors and, and beer on tap, you know, in the, in the, well, whatever, the conference room or something. And uh, the only thing I kind of want to say to that is, first off, those perks that you hear about, they get people in the door, but they don't keep them there. And if you look at the studies, uh, those companies that have those like super sexy perks and stock options and stuff, their turnover and attrition rate is pretty much the same as the companies that don't have it. So it's not necessarily that big of a draw. Um, what is a bigger draw is what you're talking about, that sense of belonging, that sense of community. But a lot of companies that don't consider themselves, or industries that don't consider themselves to be sexy, don't uh, advertise to people because they think that they're not that appealing. 
But if you advertised as an industry, this is a you know, family-minded place, you're going to make friends, you're going to have a community here, you're going to be able to build a lifelong career here. I think it was Jim who was saying, like, most of your friends and, and colleagues have come from, you know, 35 years of being at this conference and working with people in the industry. That's enormous. That's a huge thing. And the more that you're able to push that out to the broader population, the more you're going to find people who find that attractive and who are going to want to work here, even do something cooler, because that's not really what's as important, I think, as feeling like you belong somewhere. Um, I want to just kind of synthesize all of this, and we're about to wrap up in about five minutes, but I want to synthesize all of this by just saying that you came up with, in my opinion, a hell of a lot of really interesting thoughts in 15 minutes. This is the equivalent of, it's, it's about as much time as it takes to have a beer. This is like going to a bar and having a drink with a friend after work, picking a question and just talking it over. This is what you might do at your family dinner table. If your kids are old enough to engage in these kind of conversations or find you know, your work interesting, you can pick one of these questions and talk about it with them. Like I said, you could do it last night at the Jamboree. You can do it later during the break. You can do this by yourself when you're going on a walk. Uh, it, it didn't take a lot of time, and hopefully you walk out of here, those of you who uh, participated in it, feeling like, oh, that's really, yeah, I got some things to think about. It doesn't take very long. As long as we give ourselves the time, really interesting answers come. So I hope you feel like this is a lot more easy to achieve than maybe you thought it was when, we walk, when you walked in the door. Um, I'm going to wrap up, like I said, in about three or four minutes. I appreciate your participation and all the very thoughtful answers that you gave to this. Uh, for those of you who want the takeaways from this presentation, I kind of took your notes for you. So if you text my name to this five-digit phone number, you'll get a free PDF. This is not a sales pitch. I'm not selling anything. This is just a free piece of information for you that has the main takeaways from this presentation, and it has a collection of strategies for you to think about when you're talking about uh, how to find the time for yourself to come up with, uh, you know, answers to your questions, how to convince others to listen to you when it's time to share something that you think is worth sharing. Again, free to you. This slide will come up one more time as well. But I want to wrap up by saying uh, something I've said once and just kind of driving it home. This process is universal, and we've spent a lot of time talking about how it can improve your business, a lot of business cases and business history. But as I have mentioned, it's not only about our business lives, it's about our personal lives as well. So I want to share a personal story to close this out, to just drive home how, how simple and universal this process is in every aspect of our lives. So I went to college to be a high school English teacher, uh, and I never changed my major, knew exactly what I was going to do. My mother, my father, my grandmother had all been teachers, it was in my blood. I knew I was going to do it, and I knew I was going to do it for forever. And for me, forever lasted for two years. I was at an inner city school in Nashville, Tennessee, and I thought I would come in and like dangerous minds, dead poet society, these kids, and they would see the light and love Shakespeare, and uh, I was wrong. So, at 24 years old, I left teaching, and I was faced with the question I was not prepared to answer, but all of us have to answer this question at least once in life, what am I supposed to do now? For a while, I didn't have a good answer to that question, but I needed money, so I got it where I could find it. I did freelance writing for Nashville music publications. I tutored kids in math and English and SAT, ACT prep. I was a wedding DJ. For a while, I made decent money on the streets in Nashville playing the drums dressed like a chicken, so that's me right there. <laughs> you make... You make a lot more money dressed like an animal than you do like a person. I've done it both ways. So if, if any of you want to get out of baking, manufacturing, and want to get into busking, which is the official term for street performance, get yourself an animal costume. It paid for itself on day one. Really good business decision. So I did that for a little while, and then I wandered into stand-up comedy. Started touring around doing comedy in the Midwest at clubs you've never heard of as a comic you've never heard of. And that was my mid-20s. Uh, freelance writing, tutoring, stand-up comedy, chicken drumming. That's my mid-20s. And then about 16 years ago, I went to a corporate showcase trying to get work as an entertainer for like holiday parties and awards banquets. I had no business being there. I was trying to take my R-rated club show, pull all the cursing out of it, and pretend like it was fine for this group of folks. And it wasn't. I got no work out of it. But I did get a chance to watch 10 people do 10-minute versions of their presentations, their keynote speeches. I'd never been to a conference. I didn't know this was a job. And I had a 12-hour drive back home from that conference through Iowa, Illinois, and Indiana. If you've never made the drive, it's boring. Uh, not a lot of visual stimulation. I had 12 hours to do it. I had to do it by myself, a lot of windshield time. And I asked myself this question on that drive. Could I combine the entertainment of a comedy show with the education of a corporate keynote? At this point in my life, I had a background in education, had a background in entertainment. I was just like, I don't know, 
Could I put those together? And as a result of that question and spending 16 years answering it, I have a lot of different presentations, a lot of online training on everything from sexual harassment to safety to ethics to conflict resolution, emotional intelligence. I am now able to go around the world and, and talk to folks like you about how you might improve your businesses and your personal lives. And, and just to drive it home, in case you already forgot, it was only a minute ago, but I used to play the drums dressed like a chicken. <laughs> not, uh, not the typical resume item of your corporate keynote speaker, and uh, not exactly the image of a dude who looks like he's going anywhere with life. <laughs> so you might not know where your thoughts are going to take you. I didn't. I couldn't have predicted in a billion years I'd be standing here today doing what I'm doing. But because I could not have predicted this, here's what I know is true for you. As long as you keep thinking, as long as you keep asking questions, and as long as you give yourself the time that everyone needs to find good answers to those questions, then your future is going to be filled with some very interesting surprises. Things that you might not be able to picture right now, but things that I am certain are going to change your life, your business, and because of what you do, the world. I want to thank you all so very much for listening to me. I hope you had a wonderful conference. Thank you for letting me be here. Thank you. Thank you.